I'd like to talk to you about how correlation doesn't equal causation, and much like with the null hypothesis, how um, we said that that doesn't, um, no, sorry, that null hypothesis is no difference. I'd like the correlation not being about causation to also get into your head. So I'm going to write it over here. Correlation does not equal causation. So I'm going to give you a few examples so you can understand what we're talking about here. Um, some will be fun and some will be more serious. Um, the issue that happens with correlation is that we aren't randomly assigning people to condition. We're just collecting data as they naturally were. And without random assignment, we don't know what caused what to happen. So let me start with a few fun examples. And these are true data. I'm not making these up. So this one um, is uh, data about the number of bananas that people consume and how likely they are to die. And so this these data are positively related, which means they look like this. So is it possible that the more bananas you consume, the more likely you are to die? It is possible. However, are there other things going on here? Yes, I'd like you to think about them. <laughs> so I want you to think about who are the type of people to consume a lot of bananas. So sometimes people, my students will say, well, kids eat a lot of bananas, which is true. But think about what other population eats a lot of bananas in your world. And hopefully you're remembering that your grandma and grandpa eat a lot of bananas. And that's because their doctor told them to, right? And so what we've noticed is that there's this variable over here, age. And age predicts how many bananas people eat. But age also predicts how likely they are to die because grandma and grandpas are closer to dying than the rest of the population just on the age factor alone. So age may be an explanatory factor for why bananas and the likelihood to die are related. And I know that's kind of a, a morbid example, but it you know it's interesting that bananas and the the how close you are to death are related. And so you see how I put a little box down here. That's our third variable explanation. So a third variable is kind of an alternative explanation for the relationship that you see, something that maybe wasn't recorded in your original analysis. Let's do another fun one. This one is the number of pirates in the world and global warming. And so this is negatively related. So we see that the pattern of dots look like this. So is it possible that pirates are somehow changing global warming? I suppose it's possible. I don't know. But I'd like you to think about what other factors are related to the number of pirates there are in the world and global warming. So there's lots of things going on here. But the one thing I'd like you to think about is time. We have fewer pirates nowadays than we do when than we did a long time ago. It's not a really a lucrative business anymore, especially after the Industrial Revolution. We don't ship lots of expensive things across the ocean anymore. Um, we'll make it ourselves in our own area or we'll fly it on an airplane. Um, there still are pirates out there, but it's not as good of a gig as it used to be. And global warming hasn't been has been impacted by time as well, especially after the uh, Industrial Revolution. So that we see time is a third variable that can explain why we see a decrease in the number of pirates, but why we also see uh, an increase in global warming. And so these third variables may be alternative explanations. Now these are funny examples, but I want you to think about the technique that was done to record these is the same technique for all correlations. So when you hear about a correlation being done on the news, I want you to realize that um, you should be as critical of it as pirates and bananas um, than as you would be um, for any kind of study. So let's talk about some actual studies um, that are, are more interesting. I saw this one in um, a parenting magazine. And it said, and they were um, citing another study. And I do want to caution you, when you read magazines, often the uh, writers will find articles in legit uh, publications, but then misinterpret them and then make statements that may mislead you. So um, always find the original article because the authors will, will tend to be uh, honest about what they can conclude. But in this one, they said, oh, the number of dates 
that couples go on is positively related to the happiness, I'll just write happy, how happy they are in their marriage. And so since it's positive, it looks like this. Now, is it possible that going on more dates makes you happier? It is possible. It's equally likely that going on a number of dates causes you to be more happy as it is all the alternative explanations I'm going to give you now. So I want you to think about what factors might be related to the number of dates you go on and how happy you are in your marriage that aren't the dates are causing you to be happy. So the first one you might be thinking of is perhaps it goes the other way. Perhaps being happier in your marriage makes you want to go on more dates. And, um, and then being not happy in your marriage, being miserable in your marriage means you don't want to go on dates. So you guys don't go on dates. Do you see how that would be the other direction? We call that the directionality issue. The directionality issue means because we didn't randomly assign you to condition, we don't know which came first, the X variable or the Y variable. Now, when researchers put it out there to you like this, they're suggesting that dates came first and happiness came second. But when it's a correlation, you need to realize it could have gone the other way. You don't know. So it very well could be that happy marriages have more dates and miserable marriages have go on fewer dates. Is there any other variable that you might think of that could be related? A third variable. So one, this kind of sounds sad, but do they have children? Maybe if they have children, they go on fewer dates because they're just busy and the cost of childcare and they don't have the time to go on dates. And maybe if they have children, all the stressors to do with that and the time and the money and, uh, you know, the kids are sick and what do you do? Maybe that puts a strain on marriage and they have lower happiness in their marriage. And whereas people who don't have children, maybe they can go on a lot of dates because they have a lot of money and a lot of time and they're happy because they spend time together. Who knows? It could be children as a third variable, or it could also be a very common third variable, which is socioeconomic status. Whenever you're looking at any um, relationships, if you're trying to think of a third variable, socioeconomic status usually works as an explanatory factor for relating to both the X and the Y variable. Let's say you are, are low income. So socioeconomic status talks about income, education, those kinds of things. If you make a, a very little income, do you see how it would be hard for you to go on a lot of dates because you don't have a lot of money to spend on dates? And if you are low income, and maybe struggling working three jobs to get the bills paid. See how that might take a toll on your marriage. And so it may not be that the number of dates is causing happiness to go up, but that if you have a higher economic standing, that that would allow you to go on more dates. And that also allows you to be happier in your marriage because you're less stressed. So that's something to think about. Let's do another one. Um, this one I also read in a parenting magazine. I actually read the original article first and then I saw it in the uh, being cited in the parenting magazine. I was not pleased with how it was presented in the magazine though, I have to add. All right, so this one was the number of ceiling fans in a home predicting sudden infant death syndrome. If you're not familiar with sudden infant death syndrome, that's basically a classification they give when um, infants suddenly die. And there's not an exact reason so far. So if they died because they had um, suffocation, that wouldn't be sudden infant death, that'd be suffocation. If they died because of a seizure, that's not sudden. So it's basically kind of unexplained, but infants do suddenly die. And so um, this um, study was looking at variables predicting sudden infant death syndrome. So what they did is they recorded uh, data from lots of families and then asked which families had babies that sudden suddenly died and then they found that the more ceiling fans that they had in their home the less likely their babies were to die of sudden infant death syndrome so here's where parenting magazine went wrong is they said oh perhaps you should add a ceiling fan to your home um, because that seems to be related to fewer deaths so they were thinking the relationship went like this and I would like you to think about these two things here, the third variable and the directionality. Are there alternative explanations for why ceiling fans would be related to sudden infant death? Now, is it possible that ceiling fans prevents um, sudden infant death? Oh, hold on, my dog's biting something. Okay, um, it is possible that ceiling fans 
could prevent sudden infant death, perhaps the blowing of the wind or something or other. However, because they didn't randomly assign um, families to have ceiling fans and not ceiling fans, we don't know the causal force here. So one of the things I want you to think about is directionality. Oops. Um, is it possible that people who have babies who die suddenly um, have fewer ceiling fans, right? So, or the, do they, I don't know, I can't even think of how directionality would work here, so I'm actually just going to get rid of that one. Um, that would suggest that this SIDS caused ceiling fans, and I think that's unlikely here, right? Let's think about third variables. Are there any third variables that would predict ceiling fans and sudden infant death? So hopefully you're thinking of my, my um, example earlier, socioeconomic status. If you make more money, you have more rooms to put ceiling fans in. If you make more money, you have less likely your child is going to die of sudden infant death syndrome because you have really good medical care. You can take the day off from work when the child has got a little sniffle and see if they're okay. If you're working two jobs and going to get fired, if you take a day off, you might think, oh, it's just a little sniffle. I'm not going to take the baby in. And um, that can impact whether they end up uh, having a sudden death. So we know that money is a great predictor of sudden infant death syndrome. Um, we also know money can predict how many ceiling fans you have in your home. If you want to have more than one ceiling fan, you got to have more than one room. If you're going to have somebody who has 10 ceiling fans, that means they have to have 10 rooms to put those ceiling fans in. So the original researchers, which was failed to be mentioned in the parenting magazine, the original researchers said, hey, once we took out the piece about money, we accounted for how much money they made, the ceiling fan sudden infant death syndrome relationship went away, which means really ceiling fans is just another indicator for money. It really isn't its own variable. Money and ceiling fans are tapping into the same phenomenon. And so I would caution against putting a ceiling fan in your baby's room just because you read this article, because really what I would argue is make more money. You make more money, and that's probably going to be a better predictor of sudden infant death syndrome. All right, I'll do one more. And then hopefully you're seeing that some variables are, or some relationships are kind of uh, impacted by potential third variables, and some are impacted by directionality, and some have both. All right, so here's um, my own research. So I looked at, I look at patients who are terminally ill, and they're in the last six months of their life. And I want to look at um, kind of... Um, how, well, there's lots of variables I look at, mainly the quality of their life, but maybe I look at how long they live. And I also look at how the number of people they have in their home, right? So sometimes people just have a spouse living with them. Sometimes they have kids. Sometimes they pull in aunts and uncles and lots of uh, caregivers. And so I did find there was this subtle relationship to where the more people they had in their home, the longer they lived. Now, is it possible that if you have more people living in the home, it makes you live longer because maybe you get better care, um, there's all these people cheering you on and you're living for them? Yes, it is possible. But I'm not randomly assigning people to the number of people they have in their home. And since I'm not randomly assigning that, I need to think about other things. First, I want to think about the directionality issue. Perhaps people live longer when they have more people in their home because they're living for them, right? Um, so uh, maybe, actually, the better explanation would be maybe more people, they live longer because um, when they're living longer, they need more people in the home to help them live. Whereas if somebody's kind of really close to death, they may not be calling in all those resources because they know, you know what, this is imminent and I'm not going to bring in all the people to help take care of me. I'm just going to take the few people. But if you're going to live a long time, let's say several months, you might realize you're going to burn out your loved ones and then you ask all your family members to come live. So if you know you're going to live a long time, perhaps um, you call in a lot of resources to help you live that long time, right? So there could be a directionality issue there. It also could be third variables, right? So again, socioeconomic status could predict here, having more room for people to live in your home, having the luxury of people being able to stop their jobs and come live with you or travel to you. 
Um, and then having higher socioeconomic status may be why you live longer. And there could be other factors there too, um, a multitude of things, the kind of illness that you have, right? Um, people who have head and neck cancers, head and neck cancers tend to be pretty brutal and move quickly. And so a head and neck kind of cancer, I'll just put um, head here, may predict that you don't live as long. And head and neck cancers, they're actually really hard on the body and they're hard for loved ones to see because it does disfigure more than other um, diseases. And so if you're having something where you have wounds and things that make it hard for family to be with you, you may not invite a lot of people to be with you. Um, and so you don't want people seeing you like that at the end of life. So the kinds of diseases that you have may predict the number of people you have in your home and how long you live. So it's still interesting for me to know that the number of people is related to how long people live, but I am never trying to make a causal relationship between those two because I don't know. However, I get misrepresented in literature or sorry, like magazines and newspapers as arguing that I've said things like this. And I haven't. My original work doesn't argue this. So what you want to think about when you're reading um, relationships, and I often see this on the news, they'll say, especially things like this one here, they'll say, oh, researchers found the more dates you have, the happier you are. So Tom, I'm going to go on a date with my husband tonight, right? We, we frequently see people misrepresenting correlations. And I really want you to think about, did they randomly assign? If they randomly assign people to condition, then they can ask, or they can kind of make causal inferences. But if they didn't randomly assign, then you really should be cautious. So things like cell phone use and cancer or cell phone use and happiness, right? Did they really randomly assign people to use their cell phone and not use their cell phone? That's a really hard study to do to tell people you don't get to use your cell phone. Um, and so if it's unlikely that they randomly assign people, then we don't know the causal forces. It could be a directionality issue or a third variable issue. So use this information when consuming all correlations.